Good morning, good morning. Let me go make sure I've got my phone on silent. Good to see uh, folks again this morning. We're at 8 o'clock. I'm going to fix that. And we're going to get ready for devotion. Um, do keep our uh, kids in your prayers as they head on back to school this week and all that good stuff. So um, i trying to think if there's anything else wonderful and bizarre before we start. So let's just begin with uh, the order of morning devotion on page 295. Morning. <clears throat> In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. My mouth is filled with your praise and with your glory all the day. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our psalmody for today is Psalm 71, verses 12 through 18. O God, be not far from me, O oh my God, make haste to help me. May my accusers be put to shame and consumed. With scorn and disgrace may they be covered who seek my hurt. But I will hope continually, and I will praise you yet more and more. My mouth will tell of your righteous acts, of your deeds of salvation all the day. For their number is past my knowledge. With the mighty deeds of the Lord God I will come. I will remind them of your righteousness, yours alone. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Old Testament lesson for today is 2 Kings 5, 9 through 27. If you want an enjoyable read, and almost a, a Paul Harvey sort of moment, I would suggest reading 2 Kings chapter 5. Because we get the first part with uh, the healing of Naaman of leprosy. And we, we stop at basically verse 14, verse 15. But the rest of the chapter has a little bit of a, and now you know the rest of the story stuff that is really fascinating. So if you want to take some time and read 2 Kings 5, I recommend it. But we are going to read Philippians chapter 1. And I believe we get all of chapter 1 today. Yeah. Uh, no, 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 we don't. We're going to read 1 through 20. So, let's begin. Paul and Timothy, <clears throat> servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from, our God, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank God all, in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy, because of your partnership in the gospel from this first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you with all the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, so that, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Christ Jesus to the glory and praise of God. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me really has served to advance the gospel, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of rivalry, not sincerely, but thinking to inflict me in my imprisonment. <laughs> what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Christ Jesus, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, 
but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As Paul writes to uh, the Philippians, he is stuck in prison. And the Philippians are really worried about this. Um, one of the major premises of Philippians is what happens when things go sideways in life. Does that mean that you've angered God? Because the Philippian, Philippi was uh, an old Greek town. They had a lot of the pagan roots. And if things went bad, that must mean that you, you angered the earth shaker and stuff like that. Or what have you. And so that's their gut reaction. Paul is in jail. Paul is suffering. Did this mean that he messed up? Did this mean that, uh-oh, Paul did something wrong? Is God going to drop the hammer on us? And so Paul is setting up in Philippians to explain. This is a very good thing for us to remember now. That we're in Christ. And that doesn't change no matter what goes on in the world. And in fact, wherever we find ourselves in the world, God will use that situation for the good of those who are in him. Uh, we finished up um, Jeremiah last night. And uh, we're going to start Mark next week on Monday night. But even with Jeremiah, even as Jerusalem is being destroyed and, and people are in exile, still God uses this for the good of his faithful people. And so Paul is basically pointing out, yes, what, what's going on to me, it's all good. In fact, okay, there are people who are preaching Christ more boldly since I'm in prison. There are some who are my rivals and want to, oh, well, now that Paul's out of the way, I'll get to have power. Oh, well, that's kind of dumb, but if they're preaching Christ, I'll, I'll put up with it. And then there are those who just, yeah, we've got to pick up the work. Christ is getting preached. That's the good thing. And the question becomes, how can Paul have such a cavalier attitude? A, a it's all good attitude. And I think one of the, the things to ponder, a, a profound thing to ponder, is what came up in verse 6. Because I think this explains a lot of Paul's approach to life. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion in the day of Jesus Christ. What's going on? Is it good or bad? No, 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 no. Quit trying to judge. Quit trying to figure out, evaluate all that type of stuff. God has started doing good for you. He has brought you to faith. He is going to bring that to completion. You'll see the fruit of it, not necessarily now, not necessarily in things here, but when Christ returns, you will see that. And you'll see it now in part, and you'll see things that look terrible, but you might even see how God uses these terrible things for good. Uh, we're going to get in, in chapter 4, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And that's not, I can lift up a car. No, it, it's, I can put up with anything. Because I'm in Christ, and I know which way the story goes. I have life in Christ. And so there is a certain counterintuitiveness to what goes on in the church. Verse 12, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Yeah, it sounds terrible. Paul got chucked in prison. Well, I've been preaching like mad. It sounds terrible what goes on, and yet it can be opportunities always for the gospel to go forth. And this is the counterintuitiveness of the Christian faith, where we just don't quite operate like, like the, West of the world, rest of the world. Um, I was listening to Sports Talk Radio, and a uh, sports guy, Jason Whitlock, who I like, used to be a writer for the Kansas City Star, pointed out that some of the difference that goes on today is just that there are people of faith who go with less fear and aren't driven by fear as much because they're secure. They, uh, the example came up of Kirk Cousins, a quarterback for the Vikings. I can't believe I'm saying pot, something positive about the Vikings quarterback. But he's like, yeah, I'm going to go. If I die, I die. 
And that, that, that's a statement of him as a Christian. I, I'm going to go do my business and I'm going to try to live life. And there's this confidence that, that God's begun the good work in me and he'll bring it to completion when he wants to. And I don't have to worry about it. Doesn't mean you go and be stupid. Doesn't mean, doesn't mean Paul's doing somersaults over the fact that he's in prison and he hopes to get out. But even in prison, he recognizes that God is doing good. And so he rejoices. It'll turn out for my deliverance, whether that deliverance is I get out of prison or whether it is I am delivered from the suffering and toils of this life and I'm with the Lord for all the saints who from their labors rest. Either way, in Christ, it is good. And that's something that we can all work on remembering now in these days. In Christ, it actually is all good. So, having said that, let's move to our... Uh, Augsburg. Even after doing the Augsburg Confession for so long, I still want to call it the Catechism lesson because I'm a creature of habit. All right, the Confession study, uh, lines 39 through 49 of uh, Article 28. And again, we're talking about the uh, what the role of a bishop is. Is a bishop a spiritual office or is it meant to be a political office? Hmm. All right, so starting at 39. Again, the authors of traditions do contrary to the command of God when they find matters of sin and, and foods and days and like things and burden the church with bondage of the law, as if there ought to be among Christians in order to merit justification a service like the Levitical, the arrangement of which God had appointed to the, committed to the apostles and bishops. For thus some of them write, and the pontiffs in some measure seem to be misled by the example of the law of Moses. Hence are such burdens as that they make it a mortal sin, even without offense to others, to do manual labor on holy days, a mortal sin to omit the canonical hours, that certain foods defile the conscience, that fastings are works which appease God, that sin in a reserved case cannot be forgiven but by the authority of him who reserved it, whereas the canons themselves speak only of reserving the ecclesiastical penalty and not of reserving the guilt." Whence have the bishops the right to lay these traditions upon the church for the ensnaring of consciences? When Peter, Acts 15, forbids to put a yoke upon the necks of the disciples, and Paul says, 2 Corinthians 13, that the power given him was to edification, not to destruction. Why, therefore, do they increase sins by these traditions? But the, there are clear testimonies which prohibit the making of such traditions, as though they merited grace or were necessary to salvation. Paul says in Colossians 2, Let no man judge you in meat or in drink, or in any respect of a holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath. If ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are ye subjected to ordinances, touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using? after the commendation and doctrines of men, which things have indeed a show of wisdom. Also in Titus 1, he openly forbids traditions, giving heed, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. And Christ, Matthew 15, says of those who require traditions, let them alone, they be, blind, they be blind leaders of the blind, and he rejects such services. Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be plucked up. If bishops have the right to burden churches with infinite traditions and to ensnare consciences, why does Scripture so often prohibit to make and to listen to traditions? Why does it call them doctrines of devils, as in 1 Timothy? Did the Holy Ghost in vain forewarn of these things? Customs are fine. We have various traditions, we have various customs, we have things that we normally do here at, at Trinity that some places don't do, and so on and so forth. But we don't merit anything by them, and we're free to change them. Um, we could do things differently. We could celebrate some things differently. We, we have a church on Christmas. We, we, we have Advent services. We could get rid of Advent services if we have to. And we're not all going to go to hell. Now, they're a good thing. I'm glad to do them, and I hope we get to do them, and I plan on doing them. But we're not saved by them. Um, there, there's flexibility. There's freedom. And the problem is, 
our freedom, our salvation. Everything rests in Christ and his word. And the problem is, is, as sinful people, I don't want to trust Christ and his word. I want to have something that I can do that I can, that I can hang my hat on. Yeah. Speaking, I want to be able to hang... Did I, did I get it right on? See, I want something that I can hang my hat on. And point to him and say, yes, I did this, therefore I'm good. And that person didn't do that, therefore they are bad. And we don't get to do that. We're saved by Christ. Saved by grace through faith in Christ. And the church is to be a place where that grace is given out over and over and over, and we can't make laws about it. My favorite example of this was Luther was asked, how often does a Christian have to commune? And Luther said, that's, that's the wrong question. You, you can't answer that question because it turns the free gift, the Lord's Supper, into a commandment whereby, oh, if I do it so often, da 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 And uh, that actually happens later on in, in the history of Lutheranism, where, where it becomes, a, oh, we're going to do it so often, da 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 It's a gift. Now, if you are ignoring the things of God, if you're not attending to receiving his gifts, if you don't want them, that's a problem. But that problem isn't going to be fixed by me making you jump through hoops that you don't want to jump through every so often. The problem is going to be fixed there by repentance, by being driven to see your, your need for Christ. And uh, God can do that in a multitude of ways, whether by the direct preaching of the law which shows you your sin and pricks your heart, or by the, uh, the law known as the mirror of existence, where, where the obvious distress and troubles in the world make it clear that, oh yes, I am a sinner in a sinful world, and I might need Jesus. God will use either of those when where he wills. And I'm not going to fix anything as a pastor by making stupid rules for folks to jump through. There are times I'd like to. I totally understand why bishops would make a bunch of arbitrary rules. I can't. Nope. Not my job. I give out the gifts of Christ. And they're gifts. And I can't make laws about how you get gifts. I can oversee how they're distributed. But I can't say, oh, well, you... If you don't open at least five presents on Christmas morning, Christmas doesn't count. Yeah. So, having said that, we will wrap on up there with that. And we will uh, confess the creed and go for prayer. So let us continue. The Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We pray. Heavenly Father, you are well aware of the trials and temptations that we face in this life. And yet, in your Son Christ Jesus, and by his death and resurrection, you have worked all things to be for our good. For in Christ we have forgiveness and life and salvation, whatever comes. Give us patience and endurance 
that we might remain steadfast in faith, that we might continue to hear your word, that we might be diligent enough to remain steadfast in showing love to our neighbor. If it is your will, grant that we might start to see how you are using even the trials of our lives for good and for the proclamation of your word and for the benefit of our neighbor so that we might not be discouraged in the face of them. Be with those who are among us who are facing hard and sore temptation. Provide for them means of deliverance. Give them strength and endurance. Defend them from all evil. Heavenly Father, be with those who are ill, whether it be from COVID or whether it be from many of the, any of the myriad of illnesses and trials that afflict the body. Grant them patience and endurance in the midst of their suffering. Bless all those who tend to their health, doctors, nurses, therapists, and so forth. Grant, grant them wisdom that they might come up with apt treatments, and if it is your will, restore your servants to health. Be with the schools of our land. Protect teachers and students as they go about the task of learning. Grant that they might have joy in understanding more and more the wonders of your creation and teach them respect and honor and care for one another. Heavenly Father, these things and whatever else you know that we need, we lift up to you, trusting in your name, in, trusting in you on account of your Son, Christ Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Prayer of the day. Lord Jesus Christ, the giver of all good gifts, our thanksgiving overflows for the life you created in us and the new life we now have in you through holy baptism. Continue to shower us with your gifts as we offer thanksgiving for your ongoing communion, our, on, our ongoing communion with you in your body and blood. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The concluding prayers. Almighty God, merciful Father, who created and completed all things, on this day when the work of our calling begins anew, we implore you to create its beginning, direct its continuance, and bless its end, that our doings may be preserved from sin, our life sanctified, and our work this day be well-pleasing to you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. All right, folks, have a good day. Uh, tomorrow morning, I have a meeting up in Lyle with all the circuit visitors of the district. Um, so I'm going to try to drive up there early and uh, do this on my phone from the car. Uh, so in theory, that should work depending on uh, what sort of uh, cellular connection I can get up there. So if for some reason I'm not here in the morning, I apologize. Um, but I think I should be up and, well, I won't be here in this building, but if I'm not online, I, I apologize. But that's the plan, so hope to see you then. Uh, the Lord be with you this day. Bye.